Hello, good evening everyone. You've tuned into the San Jose Astronomical Association. My name is Wolf and this is Sites of the Cosmos, an introduction to astronomy. This is our August edition of this talk and it's intended for folks who've recently become interested in astronomy and want to find out what it's all about or folks who have recently come across SJAA and want to see what we do. But if you've already been in astronomy for a while uh, or you're already an SJAA member, that's also great. So welcome. I'm glad you're all out there. Thanks for joining us tonight. So yeah, the presentation of this talk is Sites of the Cosmos, but I actually have an alternate Oops, excuse me, here we go. Uh, what do we see out there and um, how do we see it, right? So how we see things in outer space is actually quite important and we're gonna spend quite some time talking about that uh, over the next hour. Now, as we go through the next hour, feel free to ask questions over YouTube chat. Uh, we do appreciate your participation. You know, please uh, chime in with any questions you have or if you have some interesting comments, go ahead and throw them out there. I do have uh, Swami with me tonight. He is another member of SJA. Hi, Swami. Hi, Wolf. Hi, everybody. Yep. Thanks, Swami. So Swami's going to be monitoring the uh, YouTube chat. And uh, you know, when you ask questions, some questions we may just answer right away in the chat and some we may collect for um, address them a little bit later during some Q&A breaks that we'll take, you know, through the course of the next hour. So yeah, please do not be shy and participate in the YouTube chat. Okay. And also before you leave tonight, please give us your feedback. Uh, we do appreciate any thoughts you have on how this went, uh, ideas for doing it better or anything that you liked. We do try to use that feedback to make these events you know, better as we learn how to do this uh, more and more and you know, as we prepare for future events. Uh, a quick tip for you, do consider YouTube's dark theme. We're going to be talking about outer space. Outer space is dark. And so when I show you pictures of outer space, they may look better if you go to YouTube's dark theme. And you can do this by finding your own little avatar icon in the top left of your YouTube window. If you click on that, this menu should pop open. And then somewhere in the middle, you'll see this dark theme thing. If you click on that, you'll get another window with this little dark theme slider doodad on the bottom. And if you click on that, then boom, you should be in YouTube's dark theme. So give that a try if you like, entirely optional, but it may make some of this content look a little bit uh, better tonight. Give it a shot. Uh, also, before we go into the rest of the material, I do want to quickly just, just mention something about SJA in general. So we are an educational organization. We are also a nonprofit and we run a whole bunch of public events. We do public star parties, um, usually out at dark sites. At the moment, we do these events virtually. But yeah, we do star parties. We typically also do school star parties where we specifically go out to middle schools, high schools, whatever, and you know, do some astronomy and space science with the young ones. We have public talks, you know, like this introductory talk, but also once a month we have uh, other focused science talks, either with uh, presenters from you know, universities or sometimes even presenters from high schools. We had a really cool presentation not long ago about some high school kids who built a radio telescope. So all kinds of cool stuff happens during these public talks. We have equipment help where we can help you figure out what to do with an old telescope that you might have found some in the back of your closet or maybe something that you've newly acquired. And we also have swap meets where you can pick up some um, equipment nicely sometimes. Now, if you choose to become a formal SJA member, which by the way is only 20 bucks a year, I think of that as kind of the, the price of a pizza, not so bad, you know, so if you choose to invest in the, you know, the equivalent of one pizza in SJA, um, you can take advantage of our imaging workshops where you can learn how to take nice uh, fancy pictures of the deep night sky. We have beginner training where we can help you find things uh, in the night sky and how to use your equipment. We also have an equipment loaner program where you can check out equipment and try things out before you might go out and buy something for yourself. We have a nice library of books and we have private observing events. Now, of course, this whole you know, coronavirus and COVID-19 situation has impacted what we do. So a lot of our public events have had to be uh, canceled, unfortunately. But instead, we're trying to bring you content virtually like we are tonight. And at some point in the future, I hope we can get back to our regular program, of course, as well. If you want to find out more, you can go to sja.net uh, or check us out on Meetup here where we are showing all of our public events. And that may actually be how you found us tonight, I suppose. Uh, normally, our location is in San Jose in a place called Hoagie Park. We have a lot of our events there or other dark, sky, uh, dark uh, night sky sites. Um, and yeah, you know, maybe we can meet there sometime in the future when life returns kind of to normal. Okay, 
Uh, let's see, and, and before we move on, I also want to plug our other introduction to astronomy, right? So I'll be talking to you about astronomy tonight, uh, giving you a nice introduction. But we have another session, and the next one of this particular type will be in about two weeks. Uh, please check Meetup for the details. And this intro to the night sky in two weeks will be nicely complementary to what we do here today. You know, astronomy has many facets, there are many ways to approach it. And intro to the night sky will give you um, some introduction on how to read the night sky, how to find constellations, things like that. So that's a nice complementary uh, talk to what we're going to do here tonight. So keep that in mind if you'd like to check that out. Here's an outline of what we're going to do tonight, but you know, this is too many words. I always say this looks too much like a business presentation. So instead, I just think of it this way, right? Uh, it's a sampler of astronomy stuff, right? Astronomy has a lot to offer. This is your chance for a taste test. I'll offer you a lot of th different things. You can nibble on them and then maybe you find something that you really like and might want to pursue further. So uh, let's get started with this, okay? So when you look out into space, what kind of stuff do we see there? Well, if we believe the movies, right, we see this kind of stuff, right? And here is kind of a test of your nerd cred. So if you'd like to play along, you can type into the YouTube chat, you know, what these different things are. I'll help you out with a couple of them, right? Of course, here on the top, everybody should really get this one. This, of course, is the Death Star from Star Wars. And then we have down here, you know, the Millennium Falcon, also from Star Wars. Some of the other ones are going to be a little harder, right? I don't know. What about this guy over here in the uh, middle left, right? Anybody know what this one is? I know I'm probably dating myself by including this, but hey, I used to like this show, and you're not going to tell me any different. So yeah, so maybe, you know, if you recognize any of these, go ahead and toss it in the YouTube chat. I'm testing your nerd cred. Please don't disappoint me. But yeah, these are the kind of things that we see when the movies show us outer space. And I like spaceships, and I like sci-fi. But when we really look into outer space, what we see is actually this stuff instead. So unfortunately, there are no spaceships here, but I do think that these objects that we're seeing here now are actually also really cool in their own way, right? And there's a lot to learn from them and there's a lot of beauty to enjoy. So we'll talk about these. So there's a lot of stuff ahead in this presentation because there's a lot of different stuff in space. Uh, please do ask questions like we mentioned earlier. And if you're lucky, I might even know the answer. Now, don't remember, uh, don't worry about remembering all this stuff. That I'm going to tell you just enjoy the show but I do have an assignment for you maybe pick something from this talk and then ask someone about it later and it turns out uh, you might have a great opportunity to ask a question tomorrow because tomorrow we have our armchair star party this is one of our online virtual star parties that we're doing now you know due to the coronavirus restrictions so this will be tomorrow you can check out the details on meetup it'll be at 8 45 because we have to go by the sunset somewhat so yeah so here check it out this will be on tomorrow please come and visit if you're available. And uh, that could be a great place to ask a question that you pick out of tonight's presentation. Okay, so please visit meetup.com to sign up for this. Okay, so now you are here. Of course, we're all, uh, usually we'd be doing this in a, in a hall where I'd be speaking to you live and we'd all be sitting in the hall in Hokie Park. Instead, you know, we're all sprinkled about sitting at our computers or tablets or phones. But regardless, you know, we are all here on earth, right? This is our home. This is where we were born. This is where we live. This is where we will be. And uh, I imagine that many of you from uh, all over the place, right? So, you know, of course, uh, you know, I'm right now somewhere over here. You know, we're over here on the west coast of the U.S. But I was born in Germany. And I imagine that, you know, some of you are from various places here, right? All over the globe. So, yeah, this is our home. We are here. Now, we can zoom out a little bit and we can include the moon in this you are here neighborhood, right? So the moon, of course, is something that's very familiar to us and it's definitely part of our neighborhood. And, and here's a picture of the Earth moon system, but from a very different perspective, right? This is a historic picture. This was the first time we saw the Earth from the perspective of another world. This was taken when Apollo 8 orbited the moon and this picture is called Earthrise, right? Yeah, so this is the first time we saw the Earth like this, you know, with the horizon of the moon in the foreground. So it's a pretty amazing historic picture. But neither of these pictures, this one or the prior one, really gives you a good feel for how far away the moon is from the Earth. It used to be that, you know, in, in historical times, people thought, hey, maybe the moon is pretty close. Maybe if I climb a really tall mountain, I could actually reach it. But it turns out that doesn't work. And of course, we know that now. But still, we don't really have a good feel for how far away the moon is. And it turns out this picture is a much better representation of that distance. So this is a real photograph. You can see the uh, Earth over here. And of course, over here, the smaller dot is the moon. And this picture was taken by a spacecraft that we launched and that was receding from the Earth-Moon system and took that picture as it was moving away. So here you have a much better feel now for how far the moon really is from the Earth. 
And this is kind of a theme of tonight's talk. I'm hoping that I can give you a good perspective of you know, how things are arranged in space, right? so that we get a better feel for what we're really looking at when we're looking out into the night sky. So, okay, if we take another step back, we can say, hey, you know, we're not just part of the Earth-Moon system. We are, in fact, part of our solar system, right? And so here is a nice uh, representation of our solar system. This looks pretty, but it, it's an artist's representation. This is not at all scientifically accurate. I mean, the planets are in the right order. That's nice. You know, Mercury is over here, and then we have Venus, Earth, Mars, and so on. That's all good. But the sizes and spacings are all wrong. And so this next picture gives you a much better feel for how things are really spaced out. And one key takeaway from this is, hey, take a look. So here, over on the left, you see these little four bunched up dots, right? So again, this is Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So it turns out that the first four planets, the rocky planets, and Earth is one of them, they're actually very closely bunched together, relatively speaking, and they're very close to the sun compared to the other planets. Uh, so it turns out that Jupiter, you know, is a pretty big step out, and then Saturn and Uranus and Neptune and Pluto are way out there. Uh, you see these units down here, it says 10 AU or 20 AU. We'll see this again later, but I'll give you a preview. An AU is an astronomical unit that uh, is a unit we use just to, to describe the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And so the Earth, by definition, is one AU away from the Sun. So you can see that Saturn is about 10 of those distances away from the Sun. And you can see that Pluto is almost out here at 40 AU. So yeah, so this you know, is a much better representation of how things are spaced out in the solar system. Again, a key takeaway is that the first four planets are actually quite bunched up, and then the rest is much more stretched out. Okay, but we can take another step back, and we can say, hey, we are here... Uh, as residents of the Milky Way galaxy. And usually when I do this talk in front of a live audience, I'll ask here, you know, who has seen the Milky Way galaxy? And usually a few hands will go up, but not everybody will have seen this. And I really encourage you to go. I did not really see the Milky Way in a dark sky until I was in my 30s. And man, that was way too late. So go out there and see it. It's really beautiful. Uh, it, it's really awe-inspiring. And yeah, you can see something like what's shown here in this picture, perhaps. Right? Uh, it depends on the time of the year and how dark the site is. But uh, it, is, it is a very beautiful sight. So yeah, so the Milky Way galaxy is part of our home. And, you know, it looks something like this from the outside, right? So when we're in it and we look, you know, into the sky, we, we see, you know, these light and dark bands. If we were to look from the outside, we would see something like this flattish uh, spirally disk. Now, we do run into a problem here, right? And you, you see my note on the side. It says, not our actual galaxy, but a lot like home. And it's not our actual galaxy because, yeah, it's too big. We, we cannot go outside it to take a picture of it, right? So it, it's imagine like, a, imagine like you're stuck in your house. Actually, that's almost too close to home right now, given the coronavirus situation, right? We've all been stuck in our houses. Imagine you're stuck in your house and you just cannot go outside. You've never seen your own house from the outside. How could you learn about your own house from the outside if you cannot go outside to really look at it that way? Well, turns out you can still learn quite a bit, right? You could walk around your own house and you could explore the inside, your floor plan, right? And you could look out your window and you could look at other people's houses, right? And combining the information you learn by walking around your own house and then looking at other people's houses through your window, you can kind of get an idea of what your house must look like from the outside. And that's kind of how we learn about our own galaxy, right? We cannot see our own galaxy from outside, but we can sort of explore from the inside a little bit. We can look around. And we see other ones out there, and we can use that information, you know, and combine it all and get an idea of what things really look like. But I know I may be actually jumping ahead a little bit, right? I, I understand often that at some point, uh, some of you at this point might be asking, wait a minute, what's a galaxy exactly? Well, it turns out a galaxy is many, many stars typically arranged in a flat spiral structure, like this picture you saw on the prior uh, slide. But Again, I know that some of you might be asking, oh, wait a minute, what, what's a star exactly? So I want to make sure that that's also clear because that's actually really important. So here is a picture you may have actually seen today if, if you looked out the window or went outside briefly, right? Here is our sun just in the daytime sky up there, you know, making us hot. Um, and here's that exact same sun seen from outer space from the view of the International Space Station, right? So when we're looking at the sun from the Earth, we see it against the blue sky because the atmosphere... Uh, scatters the light and you know everything that looks nice and blue but when we see it from the outside earth's atmosphere when we see it from outer space yeah we just see this bright ball hanging out there in space for comparison let's take a look at this down here so here's a night sky picture that an sja member took at a place called pinnacles national park where we sometimes have events 
And uh, let's focus on this dot right here. Um, this star is a star called Sirius. And if we look at that one more closely, it looks like this picture here on the bottom right. And you might go, huh, this picture on the bottom right and the picture of our own sun, they actually look pretty similar. And it turns out they are. Right? So the key thing here is that our sun and other stars are essentially the same kind of thing. And this is not something we've known forever, right? It turns out this is actually a relatively recent discovery. I think only about 200 years or so ago did we realize that, hey, those little dots in the night sky and our sun are the same kind of thing, right? That was actually quite a profound realization. And then here's a picture of uh, some star clusters that are inside our galaxy. And here, if you were to start and count, you could count, you know, a few thousand stars. So that's already quite a lot. But if we, you know, take an even bigger chunk of stars, then we talk about a galaxy. So galaxies tend to look like this. There are a few other variants as well. But very commonly, they are, you know, these flatter structures with a bright core and kind of these, this spiral arrangement you know, around that core. Um, and now this galaxy has, our galaxy has about two to 400 billion stars. So that's a lot, right? Our sun is one of them, but there's a whole bunch of other ones. But like I said earlier, this is not our actual galaxy, right? So let's see. So a better view of home, of our home galaxy is this. Now, like I said, we cannot really see it from the outside. So this is not a photograph, but this is a drawing that we've created based on scientific data. So this is our best understanding of the structure of the Milky Way galaxy as it would look from the outside. And you can see that there's a little dot marked uh, sun here. So we live here. And uh, funnily, I guess, right, so here are these really nice, big, fancy spiral arms, right, like the Sagittarius arm here. And notice we don't live in the fancy spiral arms. We kind of live in the cheap part of town, right, which is right here. You know, that's where the sun is sitting. But hey, our home's still pretty nice, so let's not knock it. So yeah, here's just a slightly bigger view of the same thing, right? And again, the, uh, the sun is, is right here. So this is, this is our home about halfway between the core and the outer extents of the galaxy. Okay, and within the Milky Way galaxy, within our home, we see stuff like this. We see stars, planets, nebulae, and other cool things, right? And if we look far enough out, we actually see other galaxy. That's like looking out, like you looking out your window and seeing other houses, right? So, so these are all things that we can observe when we look into the night sky, and we'll talk about each of these a little bit more. But before we do that, I want to take a moment and talk about large numbers. So let's see, let's do a thought exercise here. You're all familiar with pennies, right? Um, you may have some rolling around your car. You know, if you went for a drive today, maybe there's some loose pennies somewhere there, or maybe some pennies got lost somewhere in your sofa cushions. So imagine a penny, right? And now here is a bottle of pennies. So let's do a quick estimate here so you guys can help me out. Look at this, this kind of milk bottle full of pennies and help me estimate how many pennies are in this bottle. I don't know. So usually, you know, when we do this with a live audience, I kind of pull the audience and I get different kinds of estimates. Usually estimates I get maybe, oh, a couple hundred or 500 or 2000 or something like that, right? So the estimates will vary quite a bit. Uh, and the answer is, well, it turns out I don't know the answer. So that may be disappointing, uh, but I've, I've done a little bit of math and I think it's about 1500 pennies in this case, right? So by doing a little bit of math, I've estimated this to be 1500. And the key takeaway here is that, yeah, the estimates that we come up with just by quickly looking at it, right, and, and, and just going with gut feel will we'll be all over the place. Like I said, 200, 400, 2000, right? So the, the message here is that estimating or visualizing counts of things can be very difficult, especially if we're talking about really large numbers, right? So let's calibrate ourselves a little bit because when we talk about astronomy, numbers will get big. Here's a thousand pennies. This is pretty easy to understand, right? You can imagine having this pile of pennies just right in front of you on your desk. No big deal. 100,000 pennies, eh, still not so bad, right? This could be like two cubic feet of pennies sitting in front of you on your desk. Again, not, not too bad. Okay, now here's one million pennies. But now for the next step, I want you to do a quick thought exercise, right? So imagine a friend calls you up, right? And you answer the phone and your friend says, oh, I have to go on a vacation but I don't want to leave my penny collection unattended. Can you please help me out and take care of my penny collection while I'm gone? And you ask, well, how many pennies do you have? And your friend says, oh, I've got a billion pennies. I'll be over in an hour, get ready. And your friend hangs up and gets ready to go, right? And so now your friend's coming over with a billion pennies. Where would you put those in your house? How much space would they take? The million pennies we see right here, they might fit into your bathtub, I think, right, roughly. But a billion pennies, where would you put those? It turns out a billion pennies, um, is, well, I'm sorry, here we have 10 million pennies. This is a pretty big cube next to this uh, little person here, right? And then a billion pennies is like five school buses worth. So 
that's probably more pennies than I could fit in my house. Right? So yeah, you know, these things get really big, really fast. Here's 100 billion pennies. So here we have that big cube of 100 billion pennies sitting on a football field for comparison. And the little person that we had for comparison earlier is now down here, you know, like a couple pixels tall. And to tie this back to the discussion of the Milky Way galaxy we had earlier, right? So we said uh, we have at least 200 billion stars in the Milky Way. So that would be equivalent to at least two huge cubes of pennies like this. If we bump it up to one trillion pennies, here we are, you know, having this giant cube sitting, you know, next to a few structures like uh, Sears Tower and the Empire State Building and also the Washington Monument and then the football field is down here. And a quadrillion pennies looks like this. And here's one quintillion pennies. That's a billion, billion pennies or one with 18 zeros, right? So now, you know, we've completely lost the football field and, you know, even those big buildings are pretty tiny looking down here. So as we continue through this material, keep these numbers in mind, right? We're going to need to remember how big all these numbers really are. And it turns out even these big numbers will not be enough when we talk about astronomical terms. So armed with this information about numbers, let's talk about distances in space for a moment. Okay, so how far is far? Well, Earth to the moon is 238,856 miles on average. Okay, we could deal with that. Um, Earth to the sun is about 93 million miles and earth of the nearest star other than the sun is well that really big number i'm not even going to try to say it right now and then earth at the center of the milky way galaxy is an even bigger number of miles which i'm also not going to try to say so we're already running into a problem where these numbers are getting too big and, and just hard to manage right so it turns out uh, in astronomical terms we often deal with distances in a different way and so let's let's see if we can get there so let's talk about how we see things, right? So we see objects in space through light that they emit or reflect, and that light then reaches us, right? For example, you see me because there's a lamp turned on next to me, light comes from the lamp, bounces off me, hits the camera, and then ultimately that makes your monitor light up, right? And that light hits your eyes, and that's how you see stuff, right? So we see things through light. Uh, and it turns out that light travels at a very specific speed. We call that speed C. And that is exactly 299,792,458 meters per second in a vacuum. Now, that also is hard to say, right? So we often just approximate that at, as 300,000 kilometers per second or 186,000 miles per second. Okay, so how long does it take before we see stuff? So in a moment, we're going to imagine a mirror on the moon and we're going to bounce a laser off that mirror. But to get a little better feel for what we're really talking about, actually I have a I have kind of a laser in my hand here. This is like the presentation laser. And let's pretend for a moment that my hand is the moon and I can, you know, I can bounce this laser right off my palm. And the question is how long does it take from the moment I push the button until we see the laser beam bouncing off my hand? And you know, for this little experiment with my hand, the answer is well it, it seems to be immediate, right? I push the button and I see the light essentially right away but it actually does take some time for the light to travel. It's just that the distances are so short that we don't perceive that time at all. It, it seems like it's instantaneous, but it really isn't. And if we now get back to the imaginary mirror on the moon, we can do a you know, dis experiment with much larger distances and see what happens then. And it actually turns out we don't even need to imagine the mirror because there really is a mirror on the moon. We put it there. The uh, Apollo missions left what we call lunar ranging retroreflectors. That's NASA's term for a mirror up on the moon. Um, so this is the lunar surface, right? You can see footprints here left by our astronauts. I always see this Ziploc bag over here and hope that we didn't leave it there because that, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to leave trash up there on the moon. But the key thing here is, is the mirror, right? And so imagine that instead of bouncing light off my hand, I can shoot my laser at this mirror and then have the light beam come back down to Earth. So how long would it take to bounce a laser off this mirror? Well, uh, it turns out it takes about two and a half seconds, right? So that's the round trip time. So that means the moon is about one and a quarter light seconds away, right? It takes light one and a quarter seconds to get there and then another one and a quarter seconds to get back down to us. All right. So yeah, so now we can express distances in terms of light, right? So how far does light travel in different amounts of time? Well, in one second, it's about 186 thousand miles, right? That we call that one light second. Okay, So a light second or a light minute is really a measure of distance. And a light minute translates to 11 million miles. And one light year translates to about 6 trillion miles, right? So light will travel 6 trillion miles in the time span of one year, right? And a light year is 6 trillion miles worth of distance. 
So now we can revisit this how far as far slide, right? And we can express our distances uh, in terms of light. So the Earth to Moon distance is about one and a quarter light seconds, like we discussed a moment ago. Uh, Earth to the Sun is about eight and a third light minutes. And we also call that one astronomical unit, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, the nearest star is about four and a quarter light years away. Okay. And then Earth to the center of the Milky Way is about 25,000 light years. And yeah, and I think these numbers are much more manageable. They're easy to remember, and they're certainly easier to say. And yeah, so here's our nearest galactic neighbor, right? If we look at other galaxies around us, Andromeda galaxy is the nearest one. And this thing is about two and a half million light years away. That's like two and a half walls of pennies worth, right? In terms of light years. And we estimate the number of stars in the Andromeda galaxy at about one trillion, right? So that's uh, like one giant penny cubes worth, like this guy right here. Okay. So let's do a really a quick rerun of this you are here, kind of with a new perspective, right? So again, here's Earth. We talked about that before, right? We're all sitting here and living our lives. And if you wanted to walk all the way around Earth, it would be 8,000 miles. Um, I'm sorry, the, the diameter is about 8,000 miles. And if you wanted to walk all the way around, you'd have to be walking about 25,000 miles to make it all the way around the sphere. Our solar system is here. It's about 14 light hours across. Again, notice that you know uh, all the rocky planets are bunched up really close to the sun and then things get much more spread out. And if I were to take a laser beam and shoot it off over here and have it go all the way across, right? Uh, that would take 14 hours. The laser beam would need 14 hours to go all the way across. So this is 14 light hours of distance across. The next slide is our solar interstellar neighborhood. So this is roughly the bright stars that you see with the naked eye under, under good sky conditions. You know? And so this solar interstellar neighborhood is about 60 light years in each direction or 120 light years across. So, so the Earth, uh, sorry, the Sun and the Earth are you know, kind of here in the center. And then, yeah, it's 60 light years in each direction. If we take a step back, here's our Milky Way galaxy, right? Again, this is not our actual galaxy, but it shows that we are about halfway from the center. And the whole galaxy has about 100,000 light years across, and we're about 25,000 light years from, from the core. If we take another step back, we call this the local galactic group. This is our immediate galactic neighborhood, right? And so we are here. And then here's the Andromeda galaxy that I mentioned earlier, right? So this is two and a half million light years away. This is our nearest big neighbor. Notice there are actually a couple of fuzzies down here, right? These are the large and small Magellanic clouds. We call those dwarf galaxies. And those things are visible from the Southern hemisphere. So if you ever go to Australia or New Zealand, if you're there at the right time of year, check this out. These should be cool to see. I was in Australia last year and it was the wrong time. I didn't get to see it. So now I have to go back just to see the Magellanic clouds. So yeah, but this is our local galactic uh, neighborhood. Um, if we take another step back, we find ourselves in something called the Virgo supercluster. So our galaxy is part of a larger group of clusters, uh, super, excuse me, a larger cluster of galaxies that we call the Virgo supercluster, right? And here, this is about 50 million light years in each direction or about 100 million light years across. Next step back is kind of the group of local superclusters, right? And this is about one billion light years in each direction, a giga light year, one billion light years in each direction, or about two billion light years across. And then here is the observable universe. So here we are in the center, and it's about 46 billion light years in each direction, or about you know 92 light years across. Now, we appear to be in the center. It's like, wow, who knew that we're the center of the universe? Well, it turns out that actually no matter who you are, you could be an alien living on you know, a planet around a star somewhere over here. And from your perspective as that alien, you would also appear to be in the center of the universe. So don't get a big head. No matter where you are in the galaxy, you know, it always looks like you know, we're in the center of it. So there you go, right? Don't, uh, let's not think that we're all that important because we appear to be in the center. All right. So this was kind of a, a visit of where we are in space, right? Um, let's take a, just one slight look at where we are in time to put that also into temporal context, right? So the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. The Milky Way galaxy has been around for most of that time, actually, right? About 13.5 billion years. Our solar system, you know, Sun and the Earth have been around for about 4.5 billion years. And humanity has been around for about 300,000 years, right? And that little line I drew over here, right? So this, this little line is actually not even thin enough, right? If, if I drew it truly to scale, we probably couldn't see it. So this puts us into perspective, you know? So most of the time the universe has gotten 
buy just fine without us. You know, we have been a relatively recent addition to this. So I find this fun to think about, right? So, you know, universe is just really, really big. And also, you know, time has been around for a long time, right? But we've actually uh, only taken up a small percentage of both time and space, you know. Yet we are here and we're able to think about all this stuff and investigate and understand it. So I think that's actually quite amazing. So, uh, yeah. So you and I, we're all citizens of the universe. And the universe is just really, really big. And human history is just a tiny fraction of all of existence. So kind of a cool stuff to think about, you know. So let's take a moment and see if there are any questions before we move on. So, hey, Swami, did anything come up? It was, yes, uh, we've had a whole bunch of questions, but uh, okay. uh, we have uh, we have managed to answer most of the questions. Marianne is okay. there as well. Marianne Great. and Thanks, I Marianne. Are, are, are answering those questions. Uh, there is one uh, question that was just asked about the, one of the last pictures that you showed, where you showed mm -hmm. a cylinder and then you showed the observable universe. Mm -hmm. And the question from Anil Jangiti is that observable universe should be round. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, why, why is it a sphere? Uh, or I'm sorry, why is it a cylinder, oh, right, cylinder. in this diagram? Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And I think I got a similar question actually the last time I gave this talk. So mm -hmm. whoever the other person was asking, you guys have the same brainwaves. So it's a good question. <laughs> um, and uh, I have to say, I, I borrowed the slides from somewhere else. I can't remember. I have it in the credits somewhere. Um, and I think it's just a way to represent the data on the slide. So I think you're right. You know, it, you, you could easily have taken each one of these pictures and represented them as spheres. But I think in terms of just showing it on the slide, I think the cylinder view made it a little bit easier to see what's going on. Uh, but I actually agree with you that that it would be a little more pure. You're purely correct, right? If you actually had shown each of those cylinders as spheres, but maybe that would have been just harder to visualize, harder to to read, you know, as a sphere projected on a flat screen, uh, on a flat slide, as opposed to the cylinder projected on a flat slide. So I hope that's a satisfying answer. So I try, I mean, I like your suggestion that, you know, really we should think of it as a, as a, as a sphere. Yeah, good question, thank you. And maybe the other person who asked last time is your long lost sibling, so go, go find that person. <laughs> okay, anything else we should touch on right now? Um, no, those are all the questions so far. Okay, great, thanks. All right, so let's uh, boogie on. So now let's go ahead and look into space. And uh, yeah, I would say we can just start by looking up. I mean, even right now, don't do it right now because we're not done with this presentation. But when we're done with this presentation, you can go outside and just look at the night sky and you'll see bright dots and there's cool stuff up there. For example, Jupiter is up in the night sky right now. The brightest dot you'll see tonight is Jupiter. And if you come to the armchair star party tomorrow, we'll show you what that really looks like up close. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can see just by looking up, right? So when you look into the night sky, you can get a lot done just with your eyeballs, right? You don't even need equipment and there's still a lot you can appreciate. Or if you have binoculars, right, you can use those to look at the night sky and that reveals even more details than you can see with your naked eyes, unaided eyes. Um, but I realize that most of you guys, you know, probably come to astronomy and want to listen to a talk like this because you're curious also about telescopes. So we'll talk about that for a moment. So. Why are we using telescopes at all? What do they really do for us? And again, usually I pose this question to the audience and I collect some answers. Um, but since I can't easily do that right now, I'll just say that often the one of the first answers I get is to magnify, right? People will say, yeah, telescopes magnify things. And that's true, they absolutely do. But it turns out that's actually not necessarily the most important function of our telescopes. Uh, the telescopes really are there to collect light, right? To make faint objects appear brighter and let's let's talk about what's happening there and how that works so when we see things with our own eyes right light enters our eyes we collect light through our pupils right which is the little little hole here in the middle right and the pupil varies in size you've all seen this in your own eyes or in the eyes of others around you in bright light right the pupil gets small maybe two millimeters across or like three thirty seconds of an inch and in darkness, you know, the pupil gets much larger and this varies with, uh, you know, person and age. And as we get older, yeah, it gets harder to open up that pupil. So that's one reason why it gets a little harder to see things as we age. But yeah, to be able to put more light into our eyeballs, we need a light funnel, right? And here's kind of how I think about this. Imagine now you're really thirsty, but you don't have any water nearby. No water fountains, no water bottles, nothing. Hey, but it's raining outside. So you could go outside and just stand there with your mouth open right and try to collect raindrops and you will catch raindrops in your mouth and you know if you wait long enough that will quench your thirst but you're going to have to stand there a long time to collect enough raindrops because your mouth is not that big right 
But now imagine you had a big funnel you could put over your mouth, right? Then you could be collecting a lot more raindrops in a given amount of time, and you could probably quench your thirst much faster. So it turns out light kind of works the same way, right? We want to be able to funnel light into our eyes, just like we would funnel the raindrops into our mouth if you try to quench your thirst in the rain. And so, yeah, so it turns out uh, then things like binoculars, they are essentially light funnels, right? And so binoculars have what we call apertures or openings of 50 to 100 millimeter typically. And there, there are other sizes, there are lots of kinds, but this is just an example. And so what we're saying here is that this opening right here, you know, this is the aperture. This is where light enters, you know, one side of the binoculars here. And this might be 50 millimeters across. And then the binocular mechanism squeezes that light and it shoots out the back and shoots into your pupil, right? So effectively, we've now made your pupil larger, right? So from its natural size, effectively, you now have a pupil that's this big, which is a much bigger opening for your funnel, right? So therefore, we can collect more light and see fainter things. Uh, same idea holds for telescopes, right? So here is a telescope and this right here, that's where the objective lenses and here's the aperture which might be 70 millimeters 100 millimeters 250 lots of sizes you know um and uh yeah you know they're all light funnels essentially so here's a collection of telescopes when you come to a star party that we do out in the field you would see astronomers out there with all kinds of telescopes you know uh, like the ones you see here and other kinds as well but for all of these you know aperture diameter you know how big the opening is here Right, like here or here, that measures how much light the telescope can collect. And magnification, it matters, but it's actually not so important. No matter how big this aperture is, right? typically magnifications are roughly in the same range. But aperture is the thing that we, uh, that we control right, to, to see how much light or to collect more and more light. So if you had to go buy a telescope, which one would you choose? The one on the left or the one on the right? Um, you know, notice that on the right here, there's like a person or a model of a person down here for size comparison, right? So yeah, if you want aperture, you probably want to choose this telescope on the right. I actually bought the one on the left because I couldn't fit the other one in my car. Um, and it turns out that, uh, uh, you know, amateur telescopes in general, you know, are around those sizes, right? So we make amateur telescopes um, in two ways. We use refractors that use lenses. So just like your eye eyeglasses, perhaps, right? So lenses like your eyeglasses are used in refractor telescopes and reflector telescopes, <coughs> excuse me, are telescopes that use mirrors. And uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, one second. That's what you get, it's basically live TV. Here you go. Okay, uh, so typical sizes here are 100 millimeters opening, four inches, uh, and then things might get uh, all the way up to 12 inches or 300 millimeters. And again, there are sizes around that. These are just some common examples. Some amateur astronomer telescopes go up to like 30 inches of aperture. You know, these will all be reflectors done with mirrors. But all of these telescopes have a problem in common. They all have to look through the atmosphere, right? The telescope would sit here on the ground and we look into space and we have to look through the air we breathe. Now we like the air, it's really important, right? We wanna be able to breathe. But for astronomy, it's actually not that good because uh, it turns out that the atmosphere uh, distorts the image. Imagine, we can think back to the pennies we had earlier, right? So if you have a penny and you throw it in the water, let's say into a wishing well, right? Um, that will cause the surface of the water to ripple, right? And then you see the image of the penny, right? Through the rippling water surface and that distorts the image of the penny. And it turns out the same kind of thing happens here, right? So as we look at objects, you know, through the night sky, uh, into the night sky, through our atmosphere, we have the atmosphere distorting the image, just like the rippling water would, okay? Now, the Hubble Space Telescope, which was the other thing, you know, on the prior slide that I couldn't fit in my car, that is a reflector. It's built with mirrors. The mirror is about 2.4 meters, which is maybe just a little bit, you know, taller than I am. And its key advantage, though, is that it has a clear view through space, right? It's outside the atmosphere. It does not have to deal with the ripples, right? So it sees much crisper, clearer, stable images than we could ever see here from the ground. So that's one of the key advantages of having telescopes out in space. Now, nevertheless, we have some really big telescopes here on the ground. Uh, in Hawaii, we have the uh, Keck telescopes, for example. Each one of these has a 10 meter mirror. And if you were to look down into the mirror, you would see this. So interestingly, this mirror is actually built out of a whole bunch of hexagons. So because it's, it's virtually impossible to make a 10 meter mirror in one giant piece. So, and it turns out if you work at uh, research telescopes like the Keck, you get to shoot uh, lasers into space, like uh, you know this image over here. 
Um, and yeah, if this could be a question you ask about later, if you're curious, you know, what are we doing when we shoot lasers into space? We're not firing at aliens. We're actually doing something else, but it's still really cool. Now, on the prior slides, we just talked about how we collect more light through larger light funnels, right? Bigger apertures. But it turns out we can also collect light by looking longer. Now, this sounds funny, and it doesn't quite work with our eyes because, you know, you can stare at something, but that doesn't make it brighter because your eye just keeps sampling the light at the same rate no matter what you do. But it turns out uh, cameras, you have control over, right? So our eyes pretty much see continuously, but especially if you're a photographer out there, you know what you do, right? When you're adjusting the exposure, right? Um, you can expose more light by opening the shutter longer, right? You can open your camera shutter for a fraction of a second or several seconds or minutes or hours even, right? And the longer you leave your camera shutter open, the more light is hitting the film or the sensor, right? Collecting over time. Right, um, and uh, and that's that's just like standing in the rain with your mouth open, you know, a minute or ten minutes, right? You will collect more raindrops as you stand there longer. So yeah, with cameras we can collect more light just by exposing longer, right? Um, and that um, then also applies to really all professional space and ground telescopes. You know, we're we're past the age where astronomers, professional astronomers, look through telescopes with their eyes most of the time. Right now, most of the time, instead, this is all done with instruments. You know, fancy fancy cameras. So yeah, so back to the Hubble Space Telescope, right? This thing has a near perfect view of the night sky because it has a pretty big aperture. It does not have to look to the atmosphere and it can take long exposures, right? And collect light over a long period of time. <clears throat> and that gives us a lot of the beautiful pictures we see. And so here I'll show you a quick teaser of objects that we do see in space with fancy equipment like the Hubble Space Telescope and also other sources. So here, for example, are images of our sun and the moon. So of course, the moon you're quite familiar with, but you probably haven't seen the sun look like this before. And if you'd like to see more about the sun um, like this, you can join one of our Solar Sunday uh, events, which we also do online these days. I think the next Solar Sunday will be in about three weeks from now. So you can check it out and we'll talk more about, you know, uh, the sun that looks like this and what's happening in pictures like these. Our planets, right? So, hey, these are cool pictures. Um, so let's see, on the bottom, of course, we have Jupiter. This is usually easy to identify here, Saturn. Then there's Mars on the bottom right. And this little guy on the top left, hey, that's Pluto. So not long ago, we didn't know that much about Pluto. Uh, but, you know, relatively recently, we had the New Horizons space mission, which took these beautiful pictures of Pluto and revealed so much detail. And I imagine that scientists are still chewing on that and will probably will for, for you know, a decade to come. So yeah, it turns out Pluto has some really amazing features, including what looks like the heart, like this feature here. And I think people kind of dubbed the heart of Pluto. So yeah, so the planets look really cool, right? And tomorrow during the Armchair Star Party, we will uh, be looking you know, like at these two guys in, in more detail, for example, you know, Jupiter and Saturn. Okay, but beyond our planets, we also have lots of stars in space. We said earlier, right, the galaxy is full of stars. And let's not worry so much about the details here quite yet. We will get back to that. But for the moment, we can look at these and just one, appreciate that they're pretty. And two, look for some high level patterns because you can probably see that this thing on the top left and this thing on the bottom right, they look very similar. They appear to be the same kind of thing and they are, right? So we'll talk about a little later what those things are. And it turns out that also the opposite corners here, this guy on the bottom left and the top right, they're actually the same type of thing. And in the middle, we just have a beautiful uh, double star, with two nice colors. We'll talk about that one tomorrow on the Armchair Star Party too. Then if you look at other spots in the night sky, we can see these things we call nebulae. And nebula is basically a fuzzy thing in space. Um, and long time ago when astronomers had no clue yet what all these things were, yeah, we just called any fuzzy thing a nebula. But since then we've learned a lot about what these things really are. And again, for the moment, we can just look at patterns, you know, look at these two things on the top left. They seem to be kind of similar, right? They're these bubbly shaped things, right? So yeah, it turns out these are, these are, you know, two examples of a particular class of nebula. And then this guy on the bottom left and top right, they're also the same kind of nebula. And then there's also another different one here on the bottom right. We'll talk about all these a little bit more. For the moment, we can just say, hey, these all look pretty cool. Right. And, and yeah, so here's some galaxies that we can see, right? If we look beyond our own house, our own galaxy, uh, top is the Andromeda galaxy, which we visited before. And then here's a couple other examples that are, are super pretty, I think. Now, all of these things are just amazing to look at in these colors, right? So, wow, there are all these pretty colors in space. And we need to talk about that color a little bit more to really understand what's going on here. So let's talk about color in space. So uh, I'm going to disappoint you here for a moment, right? Because 
if you're going to get used to these pictures like this over here on the left, like this Andromeda picture we've seen more than once now, you know, and you expect that when you look through a telescope yourself, you're not going to see it. I'll tell you right now, right? Um, you're going to see something that looks more like this over here. In fact, let me go to the next slide. Um, and uh, yeah, again, here's that really fancy picture. Well, on a really good night, maybe you would see this, you know, through your telescope with your eyes, right? Or maybe it would look more like this or on a really poor night when you don't have good conditions, maybe you just barely see like this bright splotch in the middle. So yeah, so it turns out that, you know, on an average night, maybe you see this, you still see structure here, right? So there's still structure to be seen, but it certainly doesn't look as splendid as the Hubble picture, right? Um, and on one hand, yeah, it's kind of a bummer, right? But on the other hand, yeah, looking at it from the ground with our own eyes, we cannot expect to see the same level of detail that the Hubble can see from outer space, right? And I still really enjoy looking through my telescopes, right, and seeing these objects directly because there's something very direct and visceral about it, right? On one hand, I keep in my mind these pictures that I see, you know, on the web from Hubble and, you know, keep that on one side of my brain, right? On the other side, I keep the stuff I see myself and I kind of, you know, put these together in my mind and that really makes this a great experience. So, yeah. So looking through a telescope yourself will look a little bit more like this compared to what you see in Hubble. So then, so what is up with this color, right, that, that you see in all these pictures if we don't see this ourselves directly with our eyes, right? Well, there's a couple of different things going on. So some color is real, but it's effectively invisible to our eyes. Our eyes are optimized kind of for daytime vision, right, color vision. They don't work that well in dim light. And so... Uh, a lot of things in space actually glow red because of hydrogen gas. And here is the famous Horsehead Nebula. And uh, yeah, it's a really fancy and, and well-known image. But it turns out this is really hard to see, even with telescopes, uh, even if you have a telescope in front of you and looking through that, right? This, this object is very difficult to pick up because this red light is, uh, our, our eyes are not very sensitive to this red light, right? So we just don't see it well. With a camera, you can make this pop out, but with your eyes, just not so much because our eyes just are not sensitive enough to this red light. There's also another aspect to this color, uh, what we call uh, false color, right? So some light, like on the previous slide, we just cannot easily see. And then we also have this stuff called false color that's often present in Hubble pictures or, or pictures like it. But false color doesn't mean fake, right? So uh, this false color uh, serves a couple of different purposes. One example is illustrated by these pictures I have on the bottom. In the center, again, is our old friend, the Andromeda Galaxy, invisible light. So this is what we you know, can see just in visible light. But then we know there's other types of light, right? For example, there is infrared light. That's the kind of light that you feel as heat during the day on your hand, let's say, right? Or there is ultraviolet light. That's the kind of light that uh, burns your skin, gives you sunburn, right? You know, the x-rays, all these things are types of light. And so we can use instruments to detect this kind of light. And then we can remap uh, this light that we detect with instruments into the visual space so our eyes can perceive it. And that's what's happening here, right? So this used to be, uh, infrared light detected by instruments and then we remapped it to a red light that we can actually see and so that's why it's called false color it's still real stuff but we had to cheat a little bit to make our limited senses perceive this right so we used instruments to detect it and then mapped it into a space that our senses can see and sometimes we also use false color uh, just to identify different chemical elements so for example we might have a picture where oh we detected there's oxygen here or there's hydrogen here or something and we might just assign different colors to different chemicals and use those colors as a key to, to you know, visualize different chemical compositions out there. So those things would be false color, but they still very much represent real things. Here's another example. Uh, this is another famous picture of the Eagle Nebula and what we call the Pillars of Creation. This is a famous Hubble picture. Invisible light, it looks like this thing on the left and there's lots of cool stuff to see. But hey, check out this picture on the right. So this is the exact same structure, but this is seen with infrared light. So it turns out infrared light detectors can see a lot of new and different things, right? And that's key, right? So with different, through different light, we can detect different types of structures, right? Depending on how we look at something, we actually see different things, different things reveal themselves. So yeah, color is key. Different wavelengths, invisible colors allow us to learn more about what's out there. Uh, and color reveals what I call the building blocks and the structure of the universe. So let's take a moment for questions and then we'll talk about those building blocks maybe a little bit more. So let me check in with Swami and see how things are going in the chat. Hey Wolf, uh, a very interesting question that came up is okay. that how far can you see with 
with your uh, regular amateur telescope like an 8 inch Newtonian mm, okay, and an interesting discussion yeah there's an interesting discussion going on about that uh, Marion has also pitched in and I have provided some information about it but you'd like to okay. hear your views about it okay uh, boy I don't know if I have a single answer actually I think it depends on a lot of factors um, I can tell you that I mean we we can I mean it depends a lot on sky conditions right how dark the sky is and we are actually not really used to dark skies around here, right? You know, the city lights, even when we go to dark sky sites around here, there's often glow around the horizon from cities. A couple of years ago, I was in a place in this really small town and I was walking around at night and I was feeling something's weird, right? And finally I realized what was weird is that it was really dark down to the horizon because there were no cities around. It's like, holy cow. So we're not even used to really dark skies. So how much you can see depends a lot on your environment, first of all, right? But I can tell you that even around here, you know, we can we can see, you know, objects, galaxies that could be 20, 30, 40 million light years away. Right. So um, so I don't think there's a single answer for this. Right. Um, but uh, but yeah, we can see things that are pretty far away. These will all be different galaxies. And I'll show you a picture much later, actually, where we have seen much more deeply into space, certainly with, with professional scientific equipment, right? You know, we have the observable universe and we can well observe that, right? So it's actually pretty amazing. One, one key message here is that telescopes are time machines in a way, right? So when I look at, a, at an object that's 20 million light years away, the light I'm seeing left there 20 million years ago, right? So, um, so we can use telescopes to look very deeply into space, you know, especially if the conditions, the night sky is dark, right? Um, and I don't even necessarily need that big of a telescope for it, right? But uh, a key thing then is, yeah, we're actually seeing light that's been traveling for ages, right? And they really allow us to look into, into the deep, deep past. So that's kind of a cool takeaway. So I don't know mm -hmm. if that answered the question. I don't think there's a single answer. Uh, was there a better answer in the chat? No, I mean, it, it was pretty much on the same lines yeah. that it depends on the brightness of the object. It could be very far away and you can still see it um, yeah. because it's very bright and uh, uh, Marian said that uh, there is uh, some amateur telescopes can see a quasar, which is as far as 2.6 billion light years away. So, yeah. yep. so that will be yeah. a tricky one, but yes, yeah, so you can yeah. reach quite a way out. And actually, interestingly, um, we talked about the Andromeda Galaxy a bunch of times already, right? Which is about two and a half yes. million light years away. And you know what? You can see that with a naked eye. Right. Yeah. If we were yeah. at a dark enough site, and it doesn't even have to be that dark, we could do it at one of our common locations called RCDO, where we normally have outside events. And mm -hmm. yeah, if things are pretty good, I can show you how to find uh, the Andromeda galaxy with a naked eye. And so, hey, look at that, right? You can see something that's two and a half million light years away, and you can do that with the naked eye. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, cool. Anything else? No, that's it for now. That's it for now. All right, let's boogie on. Okay, so we'll enter a part of the talk that I call uh, nature's Lego blocks. Um, so, so here's Lego blocks, right? We all know these things. If you have kids, you may have stepped on one recently. And the key thing here is that, yeah, so Lego blocks are something we can use to build almost anything, right? Out of uh, a small number of unique types of building blocks, right? You could just have these little square dudes here, right? And you can still build all kinds of different things, right? Just by putting them together in different ways. And uh, yeah, you can build an almost countless number of objects from very few different types of blocks. And that relates very much to this thing, right? So do you remember this, this table, you know, maybe from high school chemistry? Some of you may actually be chemists out there and probably know more about this than I do. But all of you have probably seen this at some point, right? And depending on, you know, your memories of it, you know, maybe you reacted with, oh my God, this is boring or holy crap, this looks scary. I was more in Homer's camp, you know, when I first saw the periodic table when I was a kid in high school. But, uh, but it's actually a really interesting thing, right? And let's, let's quickly relate that to our daily lives. It turns out a lot of these things you're familiar with. Here's gold. It's on the periodic table. You probably have some in your teeth. I do. Um, here's carbon, right? Um, if you use the pencil today, right, there's carbon in, in the pencil lead. We don't make pencils out of lead anymore. It's actually carbon there that you're writing with. Here is oxygen, right? I can't easily show it to you, but take a deep breath and you'll have inhaled some oxygen that's keeping you alive. Here's helium that you might find in your party balloons. Right? Uh, here's calcium, it's a metal, but actually you'll probably think of it more as something that's in your bones. And yes, you actually have metal in your bones, even though we're not like Wolverine, right? We all actually have some metal in our bones. And then if we take some of these objects or the, these elements on the periodic table and we put them together, like the, uh, the sodium over here and the chlorine, hey, we make salt and you almost certainly ate some salt today. And yeah, so, Let's focus on like three of these building blocks very precisely, right? So here is carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. They were things on the periodic table. And it turns out 
Carbon is kind of like this Lego block that can connect to four things. You see like the little four you know, buttons on the Lego block here. Oxygen connect to two things and hydrogen is like this guy which can connect to one thing. And so here they are on the periodic table, right? And so let's say we have those three Lego blocks at our disposal. What can we build with them? Well, if we just take the H and the O, actually, we can make water, right? And also, you have this today. It's one of our most important chemicals, right? And, and so, yeah, you know, to make water, we take the oxygen, which had two connection points, and we plug it together with a couple hydrogens. And yeah, here's H2O. You've all heard of this, right? And now, if we put the carbon back into the mix, if we say, what can we build out of H, C, and O? The answer is us, right? So it turns out that you and me, right, are largely built out of just those three things. If I took any one of you or myself and, and I took you apart and I made piles of atoms, right, T piles of building blocks that are inside of you, right, I made one pile of hydrogen, one pile of oxygen, one pile of carbon, um, that would be almost all of you, right? So in terms of counts of Lego blocks, counts of atoms, that would be 99% of you would be just these three building blocks. That's by count of atom. Now, if I go by weight, it turns out those three things account for only about 93% of your weight because there are some other things in you, right, um, that, are, that are heavier than, let's say, hydrogen, for example, which is actually a really light, small building block. So yeah, so let's say we wanted to build ourselves a human and we're not gonna do it the old fashioned way. Let's say instead you just wanna go out to the store, buy all the ingredients and mix it together in your garage and boom, you know, make yourself a human being. What would you have to put on your shopping list? And it's these things, right? So there's certainly the hydrogen, carbon and oxygen we just had. And then in addition, you also need these other things like uh, sulfur, for example, and it's phosphorus and potassium and calcium. So, so that then, you know, accounts for pretty much everything that is in you and me. So I find this amazing, right? So. So on one hand, our bodies are actually really simple. If you take them apart into what some of their smallest bits, right, it's actually pretty simple stuff. On the flip side, we're clearly very complex, you know, complex enough that we can sit here and have this conversation over the internet and look out into space and marvel at the universe. So yeah, I find this uh, pretty amazing and mind blowing. Right? So all of nature's Lego blocks are here, 98 natural elements and some other ones that we've learned to make in labs. And the key message here is that everything and everyone you've ever seen, anything you've ever touched, everything you know, is made from these building blocks, right? Um, and, uh, and a really quick story is that 13.8 billion years ago, right, the young universe had only hydrogen and maybe a little bit of helium in it, right? But it was mostly hydrogen out there. Then that hydrogen formed into stars. It turns out that stars are mostly hydrogen, right? And they shine by burning hydrogen uh, in a certain way, right? That's how they make energy. And over time, those stars actually make all the elements on the periodic table. I realize I'm skipping a lot of steps here right now, but this is what happens, right? Stars are the engines or the factories that make all these building blocks over time. So that's a key, cool message. And it turns out, when we take any one of these elements on the product table and we energize it, um, meaning like we heat it up, for example, um, then it will glow with a very unique set of colors. Um, and I think of it as like a barcode. If you go to the store and you go shopping, right? You know, now there are lots of even self checkout lines where you just go boop, boop, right? And you scan the barcodes and the computer knows what you bought. Well, it turns out that we can do something very similar here, right? When I heat up, for example, hydrogen, right? Uh, here's what happens at the top is essentially the rainbow, you know, all the colors that we can see with our eyes. And if I heat up hydrogen gas, if I energize it, it turns out it will glow with this very specific pattern. It glows with these very precise four colors in the visible range. And this picture that's down here uh, shows all the stuff that hydrogen does in colors that our eyes cannot see, but our instruments can see it. So yeah, so these visible things are kind of bunched together down here, right? And then there's all kinds of invisible stuff to invisible to our eyes, right, that hydrogen does too. So yeah, this looks very much like a barcode at the supermarket, right? And so every element, every Lego block on the periodic table does this in a unique way. Uh, here's some other examples of it, right? So you can see helium, for example, lithium, oxygen, carbon. You can see they're all unique. So the cool thing here is that stuff can be immensely far away, right? We'll never get there. It's like one of those, you know, millions of light years things we talked about earlier. But we can look at the light and we can look at these barcodes and we can still tell what it's made of. Imagine that, right? So it can be immensely far away and we still know what it is. So now let's take a closer look at the objects we see in space. So our solar system has, um, you know, eight planets. It used to be nine. 
Then Pluto got reclassified as a dwarf planet, but don't worry, Pluto is still really cool. It hasn't lost any of its coolness, right? But yeah, we don't call the planet anymore. Um, so we have four rocky planets, the Earth is one of those, and we have four big gas balls that are Jupiter through Neptune over here. Now, are there planets anywhere else? Well, when I was a kid, we had no idea, right? So when I was young, um, yeah, we, we only knew of our own solar system. That was the only example of planets we had. But since then, we've learned a lot, right? So 30 years ago, we had no clue. Now we found 4,000 plus exoplanets. And you know, when I first made this presentation, which wasn't even that long ago, the number was only 2,000. And you can see here, I had to revise it, right? So we're, we're finding stuff more and more all the time. And uh, actually, Here's a picture of uh, another planetary system. So there's a star in the middle, but here we blocked it out, you know, basically with a shield so it wouldn't uh, overexpose the picture. And then, yeah, we can actually image other planets, planets not in our solar system. You know, and these are imaged using infrared light again, you know, with instruments. So this is kind of, you know, it's very cool. Now, moons, right? Planets have moons. Not all planets, but some. We have one moon. And some other planets have a lot more moons, right? And moons are distinct individual worlds. So Jupiter, for example, shows us uh, four moons, but we know of now 79 moons. Even here, I had to make a correction because science always discovers new stuff, right? And we keep refining our view of the universe. So yeah, so if you were to look through a telescope, you might see Jupiter here with the moons lined up kind of like this. And then there is this composite picture here on the left where you will see the moons uh, really close to Jupiter kind of for size and texture and color comparison. They will never be arranged like this in reality. This is just a composite, but you can see that each one is very different, right? So for example, Europa here has a very icy surface, right? This is essentially uh, an ice ball, which has some liquid water underneath. And you can see the other moons are all different, right? So every one of them has very unique geology and structure. So it's very cool. They're not all the same thing. Now, we wouldn't see planets and moons if it weren't for stars. Stars light up the universe, right? That's what allows us to see stuff. So our sun is a star, like we said earlier, right? Some stars are really big, you know, uh, and some existing stars are almost as old as the universe. So they've been around almost since the beginning of time. And it turns out it's actually the tiny stars, which is often very counterintuitive. Now, a star's color indicates its temperature. So we have a picture here on the right side where you can definitely tell that different stars have different colors. You know, there's some reddish ones here. A lot of them are more white or bluish. And yeah, the red ones are actually a little bit cooler and the blue ones are a little bit hotter, relatively speaking. So yeah, so even with the naked eye or well, maybe looking through a telescope, but otherwise unaided eye, right? You can do some basic science and tell something about a star's temperature just by uh, noticing its color. Now, who is this guy, right? So usually I throw this question out to the audience and pretty much everybody knows the answer. So of course, this is Albert Einstein, right? One of the most famous scientists ever, I think, right? And here he is with one of his most famous equations, right? E equals MC squared. I think everybody's heard this equation just about, but we probably don't think about it all that much, but actually it is an equation that, that we rely on every day, right? So I wanna just talk about that for just a moment. So. This equation talks about how mass and energy are equivalent in some way and can be converted from one to the other, right? So in this equation, E stands for energy, M is mass, and C is the speed of light that we found, uh, met earlier uh, a few slides ago. And so within our stars, um, I mentioned earlier that our stars are hydrogen, right? And they, they consume hydrogen, burning it, and that's how they generate their energy. And this burning is a special kind of burning. It's nuclear fusion. So what we're doing here is, or what the star is doing, imagine it's taking a couple of hydrogen atoms from the periodic table, and uh, through huge, huge pressure inside the star, they get mashed together uh, until they ultimately stick together, and that forms helium, which is what we said is like in your party balloons, for example. And I'm, I'm cheating a little bit here with the story, but just to kind of give you the high level flavor of it. Yeah. So imagine now we have these, these two hydrogen atoms that we start with and we weigh them, right? We, we measure their mass. And now I do the fusion thing, right? And it turns out the helium I get out, if I now measure its mass, it turns out some mass got lost. So the helium I have at the end has a little less mass than the hydrogen I started with. It's like, wait, where did that go? And it turns out that's the mass that got converted to energy. And that's what we see as light and feel this heat during the day when the sun shines, right? And so, yeah, our sun actually converts 5 million tons of mass into energy every second, right? Uh, that's a lot of mass. Now, it turns out the sun is really big, so it doesn't really feel it, but it's still quite a bit. 
And the energy is like 3.8 times 10 to the 26 joules of energy, which probably means nothing to almost anybody on the call. So I've converted this to Twix bars for you, right? So it's about that many Twix bars per second. If you could eat that much Twix in a second, or you could substitute your favorite candy bar, that's cool, right? But if you ate that much every second, you'd be consuming as much energy in food as the sun produces every second. So that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And our sun is pretty big, right? So here's a picture. Um, of our sun compared to Jupiter and the Earth is this little dot down here. It's like 109 Earths fit across the diameter of the sun. And, uh, and let's see, let's actually look at sizes a little bit more, right? So this is, this is also quite amazing. Here's Mercury, Mars, Venus, Earth, you know, our rocky planets. Okay, here we shrunk down Earth here and now we compare this to our gassy planets, right? With Jupiter being the biggest object in our solar system other than the sun. And now we shrink down Jupiter. Look, it's this little doodad down here. Now here's a star called Wolf 359, which is smaller than our own sun. Uh, but then here's our sun. And then here is a star called Sirius. We talked about that one very briefly earlier as well. But yeah, notice that Jupiter is now this small in comparison, which means the Earth is, is you know, like a moat of dust in, in this particular picture. And we can keep playing this game, right? So now I shrink down Sirius to this little dude down here and work my way up to a star called Aldebaran. Um, which is clearly much bigger. And then now we can shrink Aldebaran down. Look to this little guy down here, right? And we move to a star called Betelgeuse. This is a star that's visible actually in the winter sky as part of the constellation of Orion. So Betelgeuse is a red supergiant. If we were to put Betelgeuse where the sun is, yeah, we would be inside it. I think even Jupiter would be inside it, right? So this thing is way, way bigger than our sun. But even that guy we can shrink down and you know, then draw here the, the one of the largest known stars. So yeah, the key message here is, man, our sun is big, but some other stars out there are monsters compared even to our own sun. And so stars like to hang out with friends. Uh, there are things called open clusters. Open clusters are basically siblings of stars that were born from the same hydrogen gas cloud. So like we said, hydrogen gets together, forms stars, and then the stars shine. So an open cluster is a bunch of siblings that were born together. That's usually hundreds to thousands of stars in some, in some kind of a loose arrangement. And many open clusters exist within our galaxy, and we can see them with binoculars or, or telescopes, and sometimes even a little bit with, uh, with the naked eye. And then there's also a thing called a globular cluster. So a globular cluster is a somewhat different structure. That's a bunch of stars that are packed into a tight spherical shape, globe-like. That's where globular comes from, right? And that tends to be hundreds to thousands of stars. They're often very old. And we know of about 150 globular clusters that orbit the galaxy. So our galaxy, remember, is like a flattish spirally thing. So if my hand is the galaxy, these globular clusters are companions that kind of orbit around and through you know, our, our galaxy. And then, yeah, so here, these are open clusters, right? So at the bottom left is something we call the double-double. They're actually two open clusters very near each other. This is one of my favorite open cluster object. And the top right is the Pleiades. This is an open cluster where you can see a bunch of stars with the naked eye more in the winter sky. And these are two globular clusters. I also think these are very beautiful. Some of my favorite objects to look at through telescopes. Nebulae. I said earlier, a nebula is a fuzzy thing in space. And it uh, turns out we can have bright nebula. Um, so a bright nebula could be an emission nebula that is a gas cloud that's somehow energized and it's glowing, right? So it's emitting light because it somehow got energized. Or we could have a reflection nebula. That could be something that's like back here. Maybe it's a cloud of uh, gas or dust and there's a star over here and that starlight bounces off the nebula and then gets to our eyes. So a nebula that's basically a reflector. And the gas out there that, that makes up these nebulae is, is often less dense than the best vacuum on Earth. This takes us back to our sci-fi movies from the very beginning a little bit, right? Because if you see the Enterprise, for example, or some other spaceship trying to get through a nebula that's often depicted as the spaceship going through this dense fog, you know, maybe with lots of rocks floating around there as well. But in actuality, nebula are often very uh, sparsely populated with gas, right? They're, they're, very, they're not very dense at all. You might not even see that you're inside one if, if you're there. Then we also have a dark nebula that are absorption nebula. So this could mean that there is a star here and then there's maybe a cloud of dust here and that cloud of dust is blocking light from reaching our eyes. So this, this then looks like a dark splotch, right? Because it's blocking uh, a light emitter that's behind it. And yeah, these things can be huge up to thousands of light years across. You know? And uh, 
these these nebula basically represent a lot of these nebula represent what I call stars of tomorrow and yesterday, right? So some of these nebula are star forming regions. We call them stellar nurseries. You know, stars are newly forming, and the baby stars they are energizing the hydrogen gas around them, and these things will ultimately turn into open clusters. Uh, and then we also see stars at the other end of their life cycle. Um, so we see things called planetary nebula. That name is really confusing. Don't get stuck on it now. But a planetary nebula is one type of dead star that we see out in space. And there are also things called supernova remnants. These are uh, also remnants of stars that are much, much bigger than our own sun, about at least eight times bigger. And yeah, these dead stars leave behind the material for future planets in life. Because like we said earlier, stars manufacture all the other building blocks that are on the uh, periodic table. And so, yeah, so these two pictures are star forming nebulae. So these are stellar nurseries. You can see young stars inside them and the young stars are causing the uh, hydrogen gas cloud that's the parent of these stars to be energized and glow. So these are emission nebula that are forming baby stars. And then here on the top left, we have planetary nebula. So these are dead stars. What happened here is that a star similar to our own sun reached the end of its life. It poofed its outer layer off into space. At the very core of this is what we call the white dwarf star um, that is essentially inert now, but still hot and cooling for a long time. And that's causing the bubble of gas it blew off at some point to glow. And then on the bottom right, we have, uh, in this case, the Crab Nebula, which is a supernova remnant. Here, a big star actually blew up. It exploded. These things are some of the most energetic events we see out there in the universe, supernova explosions. And uh, so this nebula here is full of material that at some point, you know, could form yeah, a planetary system and maybe life. Who knows? Something like this happened in our history here. We are here because something like the Crab Nebula occurred in our distant cosmic history. Here's a couple more pictures uh, of just supernova remnants. These things are huge, and I, th I just think they're very beautiful. And then finally, we get to galaxies, right? So we just talked about objects we see inside our own galaxy. And then if we look beyond it, yeah, again, here is the Andromeda galaxy we've seen before, 2.5 million light years away, about a trillion stars. And by the way, it's coming towards us, or we're coming towards it. We will actually merge with the Andromeda galaxy in about four and a half billion years. So our view of the Andromeda galaxy will keep getting larger and larger over time. And it's actually already pretty large. So here is, again, a composite picture. You would never see the moon and Andromeda in these locations in the sky because they're, uh, you know, they're actually more opposite in the sky, typically. Um, but this is a composite just to show the relative sizes. So here's the size of the moon for comparison with Andromeda. And yeah, the whole Andromeda galaxy is about six full moons across. Now, I told you earlier that if at the right condition, I can show you how to find this thing with the naked eye, right? And when you find the Andromeda galaxy with the naked eye, what you end up seeing is the very bright core, like right here. And even with telescopes, we tend to see the, the bright glowy part, right? And, and these fainter outskirts are much harder to see. But when you do see the Andromeda galaxy with the naked eye or through a telescope, yeah, keep in mind how big that thing really is, right? I, I would love to see this whole extend with my naked eye and that would be just, that would just be mind blowing, I think. So this thing is huge hanging out there. We just don't see most of it most of the time. Here's some more galaxies. I don't know, they're just cool pictures, right? Um, now galaxies we might see from different perspectives, right? I said they're flatter structures and sometimes we might just see them edge on, right? That's like the one on the bottom right. That happens to be a galaxy that's positioned like this from our perspective. And sometimes we see galaxies like uh, face on, right? And that would be more like the ones on, on the top or actually the other three all kind of you know, face on view. And they're just beautiful, beautiful different types of spirals. Here's a couple more, um, yeah, M81, M82. So this is a really nice picture. And one thing that's worth noting here is that, yeah, it says down here, this was taken with almost 35 hours of photography time. This goes back to when I said earlier, we can, we can collect more light by looking longer, right? By, by exposing our cameras for a long time. This was done with 35 hours almost of total exposure time. Not all at once, things were collected together here, but still, yeah, so, but, you know, you don't actually need necessarily, you know, 35 hours of exposure time to see something cool. Here on the left is a picture I stole from the prior slide. So this is from that photograph. But on the right side is a photograph I took uh, very quickly, actually. It's kind of a snapshot of sorts at, uh, at Pinnacles National Park. And it turns out under good sky conditions, you can see this kind of structure with, 
with your eyes through a telescope. So I think that's very cool, right? Notice you can see a lot of the detail that's also in this bright picture. You can see the structure inside, you know, this, this edge on galaxy. Yeah, so galaxies, right? The universe is full of them. Um, it's just amazing. Here, here is something that's called the Hubble Deep Field. So here, uh, Hubble stared at a very small patch of sky, you know, 2.4 arc minutes across. We measure, you know, area of the sky in, in like parts of degrees. And it's basically 10% of the moon diameter for comparison. So here's the moon for comparison. And Hubble stared at like a little rectangle of space like this. And staring at that long enough, you know, keeping the camera shutter open a long time revealed all this stuff, right? So, yeah, so all, most of these, these splotches are galaxies. And which one is the brightest? Well, I think it's this one down here. Look at this, right? So this is 7.7 .7 billion light years away. But again, it's a beautiful spiral structure. Now, again, we're looking into the past, right? This is a time machine in a way. We're seeing this galaxy the way it looked 7.7 .7 billion light years ago. And this is another version of the Hubble Deep Field. You know, lots and lots of galaxies. Uh, it's just amazing what we see in this tiny patch of sky. And so, yeah, if we kind of extrapolate from this, it looks like there are about 10 to the 29th or 100 octillion stars in the universe. That's a lot. That's uh, like 100 trillion giant penny cubes. You know, again, it's just a number too big for us to really comprehend. Okay, thanks for making it with me this far. Let me kind of wrap this up. So uh, enjoy your views of the night sky and the cosmos. You can just look up with your naked eye and you can still see a lot, or you can you know, unpack a pair of binoculars somewhere, right? And give that a shot or do some telescope viewing. When, when you do look at the night sky, think beyond what you see. You know, that light has been traveling for a long time. You know, space uh, and objects in it are really big. And think about how the stuff you see fits into cosmic history, right? You know, we see stars being born and we see stars that have died, you know, and of course we here are somewhere in the middle of that with our sun. So what does it say about our history and future? And also what does it say about the chances of other life in the universe? We haven't met any, but I'll let you decide for yourself whether you think there's something out there. And, uh, and kind of as part of that story, I'll just quickly review, right? We start out with hydrogen, hydrogen forms stars. You know, if you put enough stars together, you have uh, a galaxy. In that galaxy, stars will live and die and form things like the Crab Nebula, which is a big blob of material um, where stars have made the other elements of the periodic table. And there's our periodic table. And, you know, stuff like that builds the Earth and us. Yeah, so again, I'll let you decide whether there might be life out there elsewhere. But certainly the stuff required to build it, we know is out there. Here's a really nice quote from Carl Sagan, an astronomer from a little while ago. The nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. And this is literally true. Okay, if you like this stuff, you know what's next. So SJA, normally we have star parties in, in Hoagie Park and other observing events. I'll kind of skip over these a little more quickly because of coronavirus, we're all stuck canceling these for the moment and deferring them. But again, instead, we have the online armchair star party tomorrow. But you can look forward to these, these events, you know, at some point in the future when life gets back to normal. So we do lots of star parties nearby in San Jose and at darker sites with binoculars as well as telescopes. We also do astronomy science outreach uh, for schools, like I said. Again, right now that's a little tougher, but, you know, please do approach us if you have a school where you'd like something like that to happen. Uh, we have telescope fix-it sessions, like I said, where you can bring out your equipment. We can help you get it going. We have speakers with in-depth topics, usually once a month on the full moon weekend. We have the Astro Imaging Special Interest Group. We have the Library and Loaner Program and lots of observing events. And just a reminder, you know, skip a pizza and maybe join SJA instead. Um, now, <coughs> excuse me. Now, if, if you're interested in getting involved with SJA, we could really use your help. You know, we are uh, all volunteer run, you know, nonprofit. So... There's lots of stuff we'd like to do, and we can always use more help to do it. So if you're interested in helping out and, you know, in learning more science and then promoting astronomy and science in general, we can use your help um, in technical and non-technical areas. If you would like to contribute, let us know. Even if you feel you're not ready, don't worry about it. We'll help you get ready. Okay. 
Now, what else? Uh, there's a bunch of suggestions here of things you can follow up on. And one of the things we need to do actually is I really want to make sure this stuff is on the website so it's easy for you to access because you're probably not going to remember this right now. Um, but there's something called the Astronomy Picture of the Day, Crash Course Astronomy on YouTube. These are cool little snippets of astronomy lectures, like 10, 15 minutes each. Astronomy Cast and Space Pod are a couple of cool podcasts that I like, for example. Um, and there's some other outreach resources. Um, Stellarium is a, is a nice open source uh, and free of charge, although you can donate money, I'm sure, but otherwise free of charge uh, planetarium application for Windows, Mac, and Linux, very cool. And of course, there are lots of planetarium apps for your tablets you can try out. Um, you can get these kind of sky maps um, on the web here, and uh, you know we can help you figure out how to use these if you like. And uh, then there are also places like the Chabot Space and Science Center in uh, Oakland, and uh, again, they're also dealing with coronavirus, but this is a great place to visit you know, when you can. And some other resources are the Astronomy Society of the Pacific, and there are citizen science places where you can help do science, right? So if you visit these sites, um, you can help participate, for example, classify galaxies. And there have been cases where citizen science participants have made discoveries and have ended up on scientific papers. So that's kind of cool. And regardless, just go ahead and look at the sky. And just kind of in closing, you know, science is our tool for unlocking the universe. There's a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff we don't know yet, right? But we keep working on, you know, pushing things over, right? And more and more, you know, things we don't know yet become things we know. And this is kind of a message also to young people out there, right? You can help us figure out stuff we don't know yet. A lot being, remains to be discovered and, and you can help us. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. Uh, my name is Wolf. If you want to send me a note, I'm here at Director Ford SJAA. Um, you know, uh, stuff in space. I hope you enjoyed this, this little tour. And if against all expectations you end up seeing this stuff in space, you know, when you look through your telescopes, please call me immediately because I really want to see this too. So yeah, that's basically the show for today. Thank you. And we can take a final break for some questions. So let's do that. Hey Wolf, uh, there are a bunch of interesting questions. Um, first question is from Sheena. How okay. do scientists figure out how far an object is, how many light years away an object is? Ah, okay. So that's a good question. It's a really good question. I'll, I'll have to give a short answer because otherwise we'll be here probably too long. Um, so I think the first part of that answer is there's more than one way. It kind of depends on how far away an object is. So I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, one thing we use is a, 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 excuse me. One thing we do is use a method called parallax, and you can almost demonstrate this yourself. If you, if you, I'm going to step away a little bit from the computer here, and if I hold my hand out and I look at my thumb, right? And I hold my hand still, and I look at my thumb just with my right eye, and then I switch eyes and I move. I look at my thumb with my left eye, and now the thumb appears to shift. Right? So the thumb appears to shift in space because the perspective changes, right? You're looking, you know, with this eye and then with that eye. And that basically sets up some geometry, right? You know something about the distance between your eyes and that allows you to, you know, you can then measure the shift and you can do some geometry and figure out how far away your thumb is, essentially. Um, I'm skipping over a couple of details, but that, that's one approach we use. Now, you might wonder, okay, I mean, does the thumb work when we look at the night sky? And the answer is, well, no, we need to do something a little different. The substitute for shifting your eyes with astronomy is to wait um, for the Earth to make half a uh, revolution around the sun. So we would, so let's say this is the sun right here, right? And, and right now the Earth is here. So we would look at the object in space from here. That's like having your left eye open, right? And then we wait for the Earth to go around the sun halfway. And now we look again, that's like having your right eye open. And that sets up the same kind of geometry as what you were doing with your little thumb experiment. And that's one way we, we can help uh, measure distances in space. Now, that only works for relatively nearby things, right? When things get too far away, then that method uh, starts to fail. So another method we use is something called using standard candles. And so imagine this, right? Imagine you have a 100 watt light bulb, right? So here you have a light bulb, you know how bright it is because you bought it as a 100 watt light bulb. And now you take that light bulb and you carry it out into a field or you have some, a friend carry it away from you, right? And as that friend carries that light bulb away, it will appear dimmer and dimmer, but you still know it's a 100 watt light bulb. So again, we can do some math and we can say, okay, I know how bright it's supposed to be, right? Because I know what it is. I know it's a 100 watt light bulb. And then I can take the brightness that I appear to see. And based on that, I can derive the distance. Now, 
again, we cannot really take 100 white light bulbs out into space, but it turns out there are certain types of events in space that also represent standard candles. There's something called a type 1a supernova. It's a type of star explosion that turns out it blows up with a very well-controlled brightness. There's also something called a Cepheid variable star. It's a similar idea. So these are objects that serve as standard candles, kind of as 100 watt light bulbs. And we can look at their apparent brightness and we know what the actual brightness must be. And based on that, we can derive distance. And, and I could go on for a little longer, but I want to make sure we have some other questions. So I hope that helps. So I hope that gives you some idea of how we do this. So different methods are used for different ranges of distance. Really far away things we, we assess with something called uh, the redshift, the expansion of the universe. So I hope that helps a little bit. So. Great, thanks, Will. Um, another question is that, will there be light interference when one is observing the stars in the night sky, uh, mm -hmm. such as light from different objects interfere with each other? And, um, and the related, related question is, from the same person, Arvind, okay. is how can one conclusively determine that the light is from the source that you're observing? Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I'm not quite sure what interference you might be thinking of. Maybe that's something you can quickly clarify in the chat to make sure I'm, I'm really understanding your question. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, but we certainly do deal with like light pollution and things like that. So, but that's probably not what you mean, I think. Right? Um, I mean, when we look at stars, for example, uh, maybe this is more of what you mean. So when we look at stars, for example, uh, there are a lot of stars that are, let's say, binary stars or, or multiple stars, right? So we might see something that looks like a single star in space and it's like, hey, great, there's a star. And then we look at it and we realize, oh, wow, there are actually two stars there, right? So in other words, we could have been confused because we didn't know that there were actually two stars very near each other and their light was kind of adding up before we got to look at it closely enough. I don't know if that's the kind of thing you mean. So, so we do have, to, yeah, so we do try to look at things very deeply in a way, right? And try to detect whether, you know, there are maybe multiple objects, you know, somehow uh, participating in something that initially appears like as a single thing. Is it, you th uh, Swami, do you think that's what, what the question was? Or maybe I'm off in the weeds, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not quite <laughs> sure if that's what he meant, uh, but, but, but I think um, there's no further response on the chat. So, okay. um, yeah, your, your guess is as good as mine. Okay. <laughs> um, I think I, I think the, the the related question was that how mm -hmm. can one conclusively determine that the light is from the source that you're observing, and and I'm thinking well, the the reason you can see an object is because mm -hmm. the light from that object yep. is reaching your eyes, and that mm -hmm. that's how you see that object. But do we know for sure whether the light is from that object or not? For for closer objects like planets the light is actually from the sun by just bouncing off of the planet and yes. coming to you. Okay, right. But for any further object, the light is most likely coming from that object itself. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's just how I think about it. Okay, yeah. And maybe another part uh, that, that will be helpful here is, so yeah, usually it's not, you know, conclusions about what things are is typically not based on a single observation, right? Um, usually you have to observe things over time and, you know, record data over time. And you also have usually multiple people or scientists, you know, doing that and comparing their data. But I think really key is the comparison over time. So we tend to look at light curves. So, you know, how is the light changing over time? And that helps us figure out, you know, what's really going on. For example, I mentioned Betelgeuse earlier, right? It's a really big star, right? A red supergiant that we see in the winter sky. And last, was it, I think this started last year, maybe the year before. It's like, oh my God, that star is dimming. It seems to be getting fainter. What's going on, right? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, there were thoughts. Oh, maybe that star is undergoing change and it's going to go supernova pretty soon, which would be amazing to watch. Um, but yeah, we didn't quite know what was going on, right? So at first we thought it, the star itself is doing this. But, but longer term observation and study of the light curve, how light changes over time, um, has kind of updated our understanding of this. And right now we're thinking like, oh, probably that was just some, you know, dust and gas, right? That was kind of interfering with the light that we we're seeing that was causing this change in brightness. So, yeah, so observation over time is really important, right? And then that, that temporal story has to make sense. I, I don't know if that helps. So. Yeah, yeah. So, so is Betelgeuse back to its normal brightness now or is it still uh, dimmer than usual? That's a that's a good question. I, I thought it's actually kind of returning a little bit, right? But I'm not quite sure where it is in that. I'd have to look that up. So I'm sorry, I, I don't have a definitive answer right now on that. Good question. Okay. All right. Uh, no further questions on the chat channel at this point. Okay. Well, cool. Thank you all. You know, um, 
So I have a couple of questions for you. I mean, if, if you're still there, if you're still listening before you log off, I'd be curious to find out what you found most interesting over the last hour. And maybe if there was anything that was really surprising to you, what was that, right? Uh, I'd love to hear those kind of things because it helps me understand, you know, how this presentation works for you and maybe can help me improve it for the future. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment, you can tell me what you found most interesting or most surprising over the last hour. You know, but again, really, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the last hour. I hope you got something out of it. And uh, remember that tomorrow is the Armchair Star Party. We'd love to see you there as well. It should be a good show. And uh, maybe at some point in the future, we can all meet in person You know, at a nice dark sky event under the stars. So um, thanks all. Yeah, and before, you, before you go, a couple more sure. questions just oh. at the last minute. Okay. So if you have the time, we can take those. Yeah, why not? Okay, so a question from Venkat. Can we see a supernova event in our lifetime? Ah, good question. Um, okay. Yes, actually, um, we will talk about a supernova tomorrow in the Armchair Star Party, as it turns out. So I'll give that little preview. Now, uh, most supernova events, um, well, they actually happen all the time in a way, right? But they don't always happen in our neighborhood. So there have been times in history where people here on Earth, even before there were lots of astronomers crawling around, right, um, where people have observed supernova events. Uh, I, I, I'm terrible with dates, so my brain always forgets the historical dates. Uh, was it in the 1700s, I think? I can't remember, right? But, uh, but there have been records of people observing supernova just with the naked eye. A nearby star turning supernova would be visible during the day. It would be, you know, quite bright. But space is really big, so most supernova are not right here in the neighborhood. But we do observe them, you know, in, in distant places in our own galaxy and in other galaxies, right? So we do look at other galaxies. I showed you some pictures earlier. And yeah, every now and then we notice a supernova, right? And that's usually an exciting event, right? So somebody often notices them by accident because especially the far away ones we can't predict, right? Then everybody goes, oh my God, let's go look, right? And then we, we you know, astronomers try to confirm each other's observations. And yeah, we, we, we do actually see supernova events quite often, but they tend to be really far away. We don't see them with the naked eye. Pardon, but we see them with instruments. Yeah. Um, and there's question. actually there's a there's a place called the Astronomy Telegram Service, which is a you know scientific uh, news channel in a way, right? And they will announce supernova events right there, for example. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. go ahead, Solomon. Yeah, yeah, and, and another question was, uh, why do planets rotate in a flat plane? Let's talk a little bit about the ecliptic. Yeah, that's a good question too. And I, I'll kind of hand wave this literally here. <laughs> and I'll tell you that there, um, maybe I should, we should make sure we put a link to this, right? This is again, we could use your help. We need your help to make our website better to provide more resource links, right? So if you're out there wondering how you might help SGA, this is one way, right? Uh, because, uh, so again, I'll kind of hand wave this, right? So um, remember you earlier saw like the Crab Nebula, right? Where a star blew up and a whole bunch of stuff got spewed out into space. It's like a bubble, right? So yeah, you'll have like bubbles of stuff out in space. And yeah, somehow we get from a bubble of stuff to a flat structure. You know, galaxies are flat, right? Solar systems tend to be flat, right? So we have the sun in the center of our solar system and all the planets are more or less orbiting in a plane. There's a little bit of variation, but for the most part, yeah, the solar system is a, is a flatter structure as well. It's like, well, that's interesting. How does that happen? And it turns out <clears throat> that, yeah, you start out with a blob of stuff and this blob of stuff will tend to have some rotation. It'll be spinning in some orientation, right? So let's say the blob of stuff is spinning this way. And so now the blob of stuff is spinning in some, you know, net plane, right? And, and gravity will start to pull it together, right? So you start with a blob of stuff, gravity will tend to want to compress this blob of stuff into a, a flatter, smaller structure. But because you have it spinning to start with, you have to preserve that angular momentum. And so, you know, you, you cannot stop the spin. There's nothing that will stop the spin. So the spin will continue and gravity will end up pulling it then into a plane and it will keep spinning in whatever the, uh, you know, plane of net rotation was in the first place. There, there are some nice animations of this kind of stuff on YouTube. Um, I couldn't tell you right now what to Google for, but you, you know, um, yeah, maybe solar system formation or something like that, right? Might be something that you can see and you can see some animations of how this happens. So yeah, because the key thing that is that, yeah, you know, you have the sun and you have the planets and all the planets actually spin the same way. Unless there was some traumatic event where there was a major collision or a different object was captured as opposed to formed in the solar system to begin with. Yeah, all these things will, will rotate in the same direction, right? And that's because they all started as a blob of stuff that was originally spinning and then just flattened out, but kept spinning. I hope that made sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, an interesting comment from Cindy. Love the okay. genuine sounds, Kitty and all. 
I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? I I missed something. Uh, uh, yeah, Cindy said she loved the the genuine homey sounds, kitty and all. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I do have a co-presenter who sometimes speaks up, and uh, yes, there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the cat's name is Zipper. He he always makes uh, comments at random times during the day. He has mm -hmm. announcements yeah. uh, quite frequently. <laughs> Yeah. All right. There's a suggestion from uh, CP Venkatesan. Um, he says it would also be great to have an equipment session. What you use? Why? What did you get at first? And why you upgrade your current setup, etc. For those yes. getting into the hobby seriously. Yeah. So uh, it's yeah. good to uh, have a session on that sometime. I agree. And actually, I, I have uh, a presentation on you know like telescope equipment, which I've given once. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I could certainly dust that off and, and have a session on that. Uh, again, we're all volunteers. We all do this in addition to our day jobs. So that's a limitation. But thank you for expressing your interest because that certainly motivates me to, you know, mm -hmm. get off my button and do that. So thanks. Thanks for asking. Yeah. All right. Um, I think that should be it. There are no more questions at this point. Okay. Well, great. Again, thank you very much for attending. I hope you enjoyed the last hour, or actually, it was more like 90 minutes. I guess I talked too much today. Well, thank you for your participation answering, uh, and asking questions. It, it's great to have that participation from the group, and I hope to see you at tomorrow's Armchair Star Party, and like I said, maybe at a future in-person event you know, under the real dark night sky. And now, if you want, take a quick uh, walk outside, you know, cool off, and maybe look at the brightest dot you can find, and that'll probably be Jupiter. It can be a preview for tomorrow. Okay, that's it. Thanks again. Uh, appreciate your time tonight. Have a good night. Until soon. Bye-bye. All right. Okay. Bye.